God says in his word, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God tells us in his word that there is a divine invitation that is extended to sinners. God himself stoops, condescending, and showing grace to those who hear the gospel. Here we have a divine invitation. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. What a precious word, the word come is. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And here he says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Here God is giving us an invitation. Now my friends, if someone like the President of the United States or the Queen of Britain or some other figurehead were to call you or to contact you and say, you're invited to come and have a private meeting with me, you would be elated. You would drop everything else you're doing. You would go and call your friends and you would call your family and you would say you wouldn't believe the invitation that I've received. And yet here is the God of heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, come speaking in the Holy Scriptures to give us a gospel invitation. And yet there are many of you within the sound of my voice who when you hear this invitation find yourself bored and disinterested in what God has to say. He says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. God himself reasons, and he is inviting us uh, to reason with him. The Bible tells us that the truth of God's word is the standard of what is reasonable. God himself is the definition of what is rational. There are some of you within the sound of my voice that think, well, preacher, I'm scientific, uh, I'm intellectual, uh, I'm, I'm a smart person, and therefore I'm not interested in the things of religion. My friends, the truth is this, that it is the most irrational, illogical, unreasonable thing in the world to doubt the Word of God. Unbelief is insanity. The Bible tells us that it is not smart, not cool, not, uh, not intellectual, but the opposite, to deny uh, the truth of God's Word and not to give heed uh, to what His Word tells us. You see, sin drives us away. You think of the two sides of a magnet. One side will repel, the other side draws. Sin drives the sinner away from God, whereas grace draws us unto him. And here he is, condescendingly, graciously, inviting us to meet with him, to reason, to apply our mind and our heart to what God's word says. Here is man's boast. I am rational. I am reasonable. And yet the Bible tells us that, that it is foolishness, that the wisdom of the world is folly. And it is through the foolishness of preaching that we find true uh, wisdom. The God of heaven ref tells us to come to him and to give our ear and to believe and to repent. And the, ref the refusal to do so is the height of irrationality. The bottom line is that you and I are born into God's world. We are born into the world that he has made and created for himself. And when we take to ourselves our own ideas, and when we pursue uh, our own vain imaginations, we are living in contradiction to all that God has created us to be. The fact is that the most important question in all the world, the most important questions are the questions which pertain to our souls. And yet for many, the world looms large, and the things of the world have great significance and great priority, whereas the things of the soul and the things of heaven and the things of eternity are looked on as something of little value and of little significance. K. 
Can you not see the folly of this sort of thinking? What is it that you would trade uh, the joys of reconciliation to the God of heaven for? For what things in this world would you trade those joys? They are empty. They are husks. They are vanity. They are fleeting. They are mere shadows. God says, come now, let us reason together. Notice that there's no RSVP on this invitation. There's an immediacy that is called upon. God says that we are to come now and to reason together with him. The Bible tells us that the, the need is for us to act immediately, to not delay, but to heed God's word as soon as it's spoken uh, in our ears. Most men say, not now, rather than never. Most who hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, many do not say, I will never consider that. I will never listen to that. Most men say, not now. But I'm here to tell you that most men die as they lived. Most men die as they lived. For many of you, you think, well, maybe there's a God, and maybe there's an eternity, and maybe there's a last judgment. But right now, I'm consumed with my job, and my family, and my money, and my hobbies, and all of these things. And maybe someday I'll give thought and consideration uh, to these other things. My friends, do not look at a distance. When God says, come, give heed to that call. Do not allow the things of this world to choke out the priority, the primacy, the importance of giving heed to God and his word. Well, to what end is this invitation, this gracious invitation? Well, God tells us that cleansing is promised. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. It is cleansing that is promised. The Bible describes our sin in this passage as something that is red, both scarlet uh, and crimson, something which both bright red and deep red, something that should cause alarm. We use the color red for stoplights and for stop signs and for hazmat uh, signs. We speak of code red and so on, something that brings alarm, something that grabs uh, our attention. <clears throat> well, if that is true, on that scale, how much more is it true that we should see our sins as something that are alarming? That's the most basic problem we face. This nation, uh, this state, uh, our families, our business, the thing that we face that is the bigger question than any other question is the question, how do we solve the problem of our sin? What is sin? Sin is not being and not doing uh, what God requires of us. God has spoken in his law, God has spoken in his word, and given us direction on who he is, who we are, and what he requires of us. And sin is failing to live up to that. This passage says that sin is like blood. It stains the soul. If you were to cut uh, your arm and to get blood on your shirt, what happens? If you don't treat that, it's stained. Eventually it'll turn black and become very difficult uh, to get out. Here God is telling us that our souls are stained uh, with sin. He says that our sin is like scarlet and like crimson, both our insides as well as our outsides. We are like Lady Macbeth in Shakespeare, who said, Will all the perfumes of Arabia not cleanse? this my hand. We find ourselves in similar circumstances. There is no power and ability within us to somehow purge, to cleanse uh, the stains of sin within our soul. There is no scientist, there is no laboratory, there is no laundry mat, there is no doctor that is able to launder the soul. 
There is nothing in our own power that gives us the ability to solve by cleaning up our sin-stained souls, solve the problem of sin in our lives. No, the Bible tells us all of that pursuit would be vanity. Some of you sitting within the sound of my voice and walking on this street and driving in your car, some of you are tempted to say, well, I know I'm not perfect. I know not everything's right. I know I do things wrong. But preacher, I'm going to do better. I'll, I'll resolve to be nicer, to be more honest, to be more giving. And in doing so, I'll somehow tip the scales of the balance with regards to my sin. I'll somehow bring God uh, to, to look with favor upon me because of the good things uh, that I'm doing. This is an attempt to launder our soul with something that is incapable of cleansing it uh, at all. The Bible tells us this is foolishness. The guilt and pollution of sin. We're like a coal miner who comes up out of the, uh, out of the coals, covered in, in the black uh, coal dust. We, we have that sort of filthiness. <clears throat> the sin and idolatry of our heart. We are guilty as well as polluted. We have a record, and that record says, a record of all that we've been, all that we've said, all that we've thought, all that we have had ambitions, all the attitudes we've entertained. And that record gives an account of all of the violations and transgressions of the law of God. That record proves our guiltiness. We are guilty before a holy God. And just as if you break a legitimate law within this land and are tried and found guilty, you will be declared guilty. So we are tried and held in the balance by God and His law and are found guilty before Him and His holiness. We're also polluted. Our inside is stained with sin. It's not just what we've done. It's who we are by nature. Our hearts are alienated from God. And so we have all of these attempts to do good works. The Bible says that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That is our best parts. Our, our, the part that we esteem. The part that we think is, is uh, impeccable or at least valuable. The Bible says even those parts are as filthy rags. And yet here is God, the God of heaven, the God against whom we have waged war, the God whom we are enemies of, the God whom we have transgressed against, the God whom we have, from the time we were born, lived our lives in antithesis to. This same God comes promising mercy and promising cleansing to those who hear the gospel of His free grace. He says, your sins are crimson. They are scarlet. That's reality check. That's you coming to terms with what is real and not playing make-believe and not pretending that things are different than they are. God comes to you and like the ostrich, He grabs you by the neck and pulls your head out of the sand and says, the truth is, your soul is stained with sin. But the truth is that God comes in the gospel offering to cleanse. He says, I'll make you white as snow. I will make you as white as wool. Well, how is it that the God of heaven can take what is stained like scarlet and stained like crimson and make it white? Well, there's only one way. And that way is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says to his believing people, I have loved you and washed you from your sins with my own blood. It is the blood of Christ. The Bible has a dogmatism about it that is unashamed, that is not embarrassed. In this postmodern world, the Bible comes to us and says, unequivocally, unashamedly, unembarrassedly, 
Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. There's an exclusiveness in the Gospel. Not Allah, not Buddha, not other false religions, not your vain philosophy, not some sort of morality and religiosity, not all of those things. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through Him. It is Christ and Christ alone who is able to redeem and to pardon and to cleanse and to forgive. And He does so by His blood. Now you say, Pastor, what does that mean? Are we talking about physical blood being put on our physical bodies? And the answer is, of course, of course not. Of course not. We're describing the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in the cross. We're describing His redeeming work at the cross. What took place at the cross? Most of you, within the sound of my voice, have heard that much, that Jesus died on a cross. What was that all about? Christ did not die as a martyr, as a philosopher, as a glorified hippie. Jesus didn't die to show some sort of cosmic, universal benevolence to the world in general. Jesus died on the cross as a substitute for his believing people. Jesus was carrying out a work of redemption on the cross. The Bible tells us that our sins condemn us. Our violations of the law come with the punishment and penalty. When Christ died on the cross, he was taking on himself the punishment. Jesus was paying the penalty. Christ was, was paying the punishment in himself for his people. The wrath and indignation and holy justice of God against sin was being poured out. This, that, that anger, that just indignation against the sins of His people were being poured out on Christ. So Christ is bearing up under that. He's appeasing it. He's satisfying it. He is atoning for it. Christ is there as a substitute for sinners, taking the punishment of sin on behalf of those who would believe upon Him. This is what the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is making reference to. The death of Christ, Him bearing the penalty, Him atoning for guilt, Him appeasing of the wrath of God. And this is the glorious transaction. Here you are, a sinner. <clears throat> Here is Christ full of righteousness. He obeys the law in every point. He keeps all the commandments. He is without spot, without blemish. He is sinless. And here you are with all the transgressions of the law. And there's this great transaction that takes place in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, where the sins of His people are placed on Christ and He bears the penalty for those sins. And the righteousness of Christ is credited to the account of those who in themselves are guilty in order that they might be made accepted before God in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. This is the message that God brings to us when He says, I will take your sin-stained soul and make it white like snow and white like wool. Here the Lord Jesus offers us a new heart and a new life. He's saying, look at all the blessings. Some of you are tempted to say, well, preacher, you don't know where I've been. You haven't been in my shoes. You don't know the things I've done. You don't know all the places I've been. If you did, you would recognize that I am in a position outside of the reach of these kinds of mercies. My friends, the reason you think that way 
is because you're, you're thinking in terms of what you do and don't do, making you acceptable in God's sight. And God is saying, God tells us in His Word, it's not what we do for God, but what God has done for us in the person of His own Son. The Lord Jesus Christ made satisfaction for all sin, for all the sins of His people, in order that there might be a comprehensive atonement for His people. Here is Christ saying, I have paid to the last drop, to the last penalty. I have plummeted the depths. I have gone the lengths. I have exhausted the full extent of all that is required to pay for the sins of those who come to me. You see, there is a fountain that cannot be drained because the infinite Son of God has come to secure the salvation of His people. There are some of you who are tempted to say, well, I'm really not that interested. The bottom line is, I don't care. That's the truth. Many of you don't care about what God says and what even the, the, the preaching of the gospel. Think with me for a second about how utterly and absolutely irrational that is. God comes offering mercy and we spurn Him. To forsake our own mercies is the height of irrationality. It is the height of irrationality. If someone, if you were to go to the doctor and he were to say, I got bad news for you. You've been diagnosed with some horrendous disease that's going to kill you soon. However, we have a remedy and there's a way that we can treat that condition that has an absolute 100% success rate in curing you. Would you say, be quiet, I don't care. You know, what would you think of a person who went on living and they filled their lives with all sorts of things to distract them so that they didn't have to think about it. And they busied themselves at work and they, they, they gave their strength to their hobbies and money and interest and said, this is what I care for. This is what's important. You'd say, what a fool. You've been, it was, it was merciful that the doctor diagnosed you and brought a remedy. It's the same in the preaching of the gospel. God is coming with offers of mercy to stiffen your neck, to harden your heart, to stiffen your arm against the proclamations of the gospel is to forsake your own mercies. It is foolishness. It is not wisdom. Well, what does this do? This gives, this invokes, does it not, a response. We get an invitation. We're required to respond uh, to that invitation. Life is being offered to us, free, without price. Cleansing mercy is being offered to us by God. Life is being offered to us. The Bible tells us that sin brings with it its wages and that the wages of sin is death. There is a price. If you die with the bloody stains of sin upon your soul and without the blood of Christ being sprinkled upon you, the Bible tells us you will perish. It brings me no pleasure to say that. I don't get a kick out of saying that. This is, this, is, this is God's gracious condescension to bring the offers of mercy within the sound of our ears. What would we lose our souls for in this world? What would we be willing to trade time for eternity for? The question is, what will we do with the Lord Jesus Christ? What will we do with His law? What will we do with the proclamation of His Word and His Gospel? We are told to look upon the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. 
If you had a question that was asked, you brought a hundred students together, and there was one question with one answer, and all of the students gave a hundred different answers, you'd say they can't all be right. Only one can be right. And that's the truth when it comes to the big questions. Who am I? What is my purpose? What happens after this life? Who is God? Uh, what is the Bible? The Bible gives us, God tells us there are clear, unequivocal answers that are found in His Word. But it requires us to look away from ourselves. It requires us to look away from uh, our history, our friends, our family, and to look to the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, come unto me, all ye the ends of the earth, and be ye saved. The Bible tells us that Christ is willing, that he will by no means cast out all who come uh, to him. Here is God coming in the gospel of his, of his word, calling upon us to repent and to believe. What is faith? Faith is not a leap in the dark. Faith is not a uh, some irrational exercise of the mind. Faith is the most rational, logical, reasonable thing we can do. It is to act upon what God Himself has said. It is to, ra it is to look away from our own strength and righteousness, to look away from ourselves, and instead to rest and put the full weight of our soul upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to trust Him for what He's done for us rather than to rely upon uh, our own strength and what we've done. To repent is to have a reality check. It is to come to terms with, with what is true about us, to see sin as it is, not as a mistake, not as weakness, but as a violation of God's laws, an affront to God Himself. David could say in Psalm 51, after committing adultery and killing someone against thee and thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. He was coming to terms with seeing his sin for what it really is. And repentance is seeing sin for what it is and turning away from sin and turning to God in his mercy who is willing graciously to receive, to receive us. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool.